Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Positive Post in Conversation. I'm Zazie Todd. I'm jo joined, as always, by my friend and colleague, Christy Benson. Hi, Christy. Hello. And today we have a very special guest whose book I absolutely love. So we're talking to Dr. Joe Wimpany. Joe Wimpany is a zoologist and writer with a research background in animal behavior and the history of science. She studied zoology at the University of Bristol and went on to research problem solving in crows for her DPhil at Oxford University. After postdoctoral research on the history of ornithology at Sheffield, she co-authored the book 10,000 Birds, Ornithology Since Darwin with Tim Burkhead and Bob Montgomery, which won the 2015 Prose Award for the History of Science, Medicine and Technology, which is fantastic. And she's the author of an absolutely wonderful book called Aesop's Animals, which we we'll be talking about today. And the book club read this book a little while back and it's just wonderful it's this really wonderful idea and it's beautifully beautifully done so you take a set of fables from Aesop and you explore the extent to which they're true and what modern science can tell us about the animals in those fables and it's just a wonderful story all the way through and it's a brilliant read and I absolutely loved it um, so thank you very much for coming to chat to us about it today Oh, thank you for that introduction. Um, thanks for having me. It's really good um, to be here. It's our pleasure. So first of all, how did you come up with the idea to compare Aesop's, fa Aesop's fables with what we know about animals? Yeah, so um, as you said, I did my PhD on crow cognition. Um, so that was at Oxford. And it was soon after I finished that that this pivotal study was published um, on rooks, which was the first demonstration of, uh, well, the first replication really of an Aesop's fable. So it was the fable of the, the crow in the picture, um, which I can just expand slightly. I'm sure your listeners are familiar, but there's a very thirsty crow um, that comes across a picture with water in it, but it can't reach the water because it can't get its head inside the neck of the picture. Um, so what it does is it drops stones into the, the picture and little by little it brings up the water level um, and so it can drink. So it saves itself from dying of thirst by this amazing problem solving feat. Um, and so this experiment was replicated in, I think, 2009 um, at the University of Cambridge. And they did it with rooks, which are another kind of corvid, so a member of the crow family. And they found that the rooks did it. Um, and so I'd sort of just come out of my PhD and I was quite struck by this experiment. Um, and it, it wasn't immediate, but it sowed the seeds for this idea of, I wonder which other fables might actually be supported by science. Um, and so the idea was kind of born out of that. Uh, it was a bit of a slow burner. But, you know, I spent years worrying that somebody else was, was going to write all about it. Um, before I sort of got my <laughs> ass in gear and actually did it. <laughs> well, thankfully they didn't, and you got to do it. <laughs> and these are very old fables, aren't they? They're from such a long time ago. So to think about them now in terms of modern science is is a really interesting idea. But because they're they're part of our cultural history, did you grow up with a copy of Aesop's Fables? You know, I don't even remember, and um, I'd love for it to be the case that I fondly remember listening, you know, to to my parents reading Aesop's Fables. I was definitely familiar with them. I'm sure we probably had a copy. Um, and and yeah, what you say about them being really old stories, they, you know, they date back. Well, we don't know that much about Aesop, but current sort of idea is that he lived some five to six hundred years BC. So you know, if he produced these fables, and we know that several of them will have been added to, um, and they've sort of evolved over the years, but we're still looking at over 2000 year old stories. Uh, and so the thing that struck me was just how amazing, how bizarre actually it is, that we still tell these stories that are so old, and that our beliefs about certain animals are still influenced by these stories that are, you know, we've moved on in so many ways in our society, but these things still influence us from such an early age. And so that was one of my main motivations and things that I wanted to explore in the book. I think it's such a great hook too, you know, like 
because everybody is exposed to these stories, you really know them. Um, and I, I think, you know, your point was really good in the book that these are, these aren't stories about animals per se, they're stories about teaching about human morality, you know, and, mm -hmm. and human society and human behavior and how humans should act, you know, but <clears throat> because it's animals, it becomes, you know, like it is, it becomes a part of our sort of like the fabric of how we think about animals was sort of set up in these stories. So it's, it was really neat. I thought it was a great hook to be like, okay, well, yeah, I do. I didn't realize that I thought that way about animals because mm. of this story that I heard. And we didn't have a copy in my house as I, you know, when I was a kid, but I think we read them in like, I don't know, grade five or something. Like I, I, I remember checking them out of the library and reading them and, you know, being, finding them really satisfying as a yeah. kid, you know, <laughs> there's something so satisfying about those stories. So yeah, I, you know, I think your writing also is, is great. I think you do a, a, a really good job of, of taking the science and making it interesting, but not dumbed down, which I think is, I don't think the book would have had it, the legs it has without, you know, your writing, as well as the hook of just being like, oh God, these stories are so familiar to us. Oh, thank you. I mean, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to achieve, really. It's stories about science and, and science had to be at the heart of them. Um, I didn't want to trivialize what we know because some of the science is so complicated. Um, so there's a lot in that book. There are a lot of findings and that's a remarkable testimony really to the, the way that the field of animal cognition and everything that we know about animal behavior has really grown. Um, but it's great to hear that, that yeah, you, you like yeah. the writing style, that's good. Thanks. <laughs> so in one of the chapters, um, the dog and its shadow, um, it takes the starting point of the question of whether dogs can recognize themselves in a mirror. Um, and as well as answering this question, you look at what a dog centered approach to addressing this question might be. So can you talk us through that? Mm, sure. So the fa in the fable, there's a dog, uh, it's got this lovely juicy bone um, and it's hurrying home uh, and it goes across the bridge over um, a river or a, a lake or something um, and it sees its reflection. And in the fable, it doesn't recognize that the reflection is itself. It sees another dog. Um, and so it does what dogs do and it barks at the other dog um, and therefore drops his bone into the water and loses it. And so I saw this as a really nice way of getting into the topic of self-awareness um, and mirror self-recognition. And that's, I mean, that's a topic that has some controversy to it. So classically, um, the way that people would ask whether animals are self-aware or, you know, whether they can realize that they're looking at themselves rather than another animal would be um, to use the mirror test and the mirror self-recognition test, which was pioneered by Gordon Gallup with chimpanzees back in the early 1970s. And that test has sort of become, well, very much become the gold standard test for asking whether animals are self-aware. But um, for things like dogs and lots of other animals, they don't pass it. Um, so in that respect, Aesop was quite right in the fable, in that, and, and you can see this from YouTube, I'm sure, and um, I'm sure lots of your listeners will have seen this in their dogs as well, that if they stand in front of a mirror, they're more likely to, to bark at the reflection, um, or they're more likely to try and initiate play with it, or or maybe they'll just ignore it. But there's or look no behind. Evidence. Yeah, there's no <laughs> evidence that they look in the in the mirror and say, "Oh, that's me," and I need to, you know, I need to get this thing off my face or, or right. whatever it is. Um, and so the classic interpretation of animals that fail that test is that they aren't self-aware. But quite a lot of people have called that interpretation into question. Um, so I said it's perhaps not as black and white as that. And rather than saying we can only get information about self-awareness from animals that pass it. We need to really be asking, what does it mean if animals don't pass it? You know, can we really say that that means they've got no self-awareness? And so it was um, people like Mark Beckoff uh, and Alexandra Horowitz who pioneered these studies with dogs, taking a very different approach. And they decided, well, they thought it made a lot more sense to ask what the dog knows through its sense of smell because sense of smell is so very important to dogs 
um, and so much of their kind of recognition is done through their nose rather than through their eyes that ecologically it it makes sense that they might actually recognize other animals and recognize themselves um, through the, what they're smelling. So so they pioneered these tests. Mark Beckoff initially um, did a, a test called the yellow snow test and he just sort of tried this out with his own dog um, uh, and noticed that when he was out walking in the snow with his dog, uh, if he moved his dog's urine further down the path um, while his dog was off, you know, in the bushes, sniffing around, um, the dog would he'd come back and actually pay attention to to that patch of urine. Um, and if he moved the urine of other dogs as well, he could see these differences in the way that it was sniffing at its urine versus mm-hmm. others. Um, and so, and then Alexandra Horowitz took this into the lab and did more experiments on asking whether dogs have this um, olfactory sense of self. Uh, and the evidence seems to be that yes, they they might well recognise themselves based on what they're smelling rather than what they're seeing in a mirror. Very cool. I think that's very very cool. So, is there a fable that got things completely like absolutely completely wrong when it comes to animals? Mm. Uh, I would say the wolf, but I would say every story pretty much that we ever hear about wolves is is pretty much wrong. I mean. People are now starting to write stories which portray wolves quite nicely, I think. But, you know, the classic big bad wolf, the wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, so that is the Aesop's fable, is the wolf in sheep's clothing. But there were lots of Aesop's fables about wolves. And in every single one, pretty much, the wolf is portrayed as this ruthless, um, deceptive, vicious killer, often a lone animal which um you know plots to do nasty things and and that's the portrayal i think that has been continued over the generations and and been laid down into our children's stories and things like little red riding hood or peter and the wolf or um three little pigs you know there are so many children's stories that portray wolves as these big bad villains and it's it's just not true I mean, one of my main objections to that is what we can even, what we even mean by the word villain when we apply it to animals, because that's a very human word. And and of course, these fables were about conveying um, human morality. And so lots of those portrayals are tied up in very human language. But a wolf isn't a villain because that's a label that brings with it lots and lots of human baggage I think and it's the same for something like the fox if we call it um yeah a trickster or cunning or any of these things which kind of implies that they're doing things in this nasty way and they're they're plotting to deceive us um so I was very happy to to try and um shoot down that myth I suppose um, and portray some of the true characteristics of wolves in in that particular chapter. I think one of the favorite sort of ways of conceptualizing animals that I've learned so I do a lot of work I'm an anthropologist and I do a lot of work with indigenous communities here in Canada and one of the ways that they talk about how animals behave is they use this sort of catchphrase of make a living so instead of instead of implying these or, or sort of imposing these moral statements and human labels which they do too as well you know t- to a lesser extent but but they just you know if you say well what what's that animal doing it, the, they'll often be this coming back of he's just making a living in the world you know so mm-hmm. just having that which i love that sort of way of thinking about it because we're just making a living in our world too um and then animals are just making a living in their world so I I love that as sort of like a better reframe (laughs) of what what are the wolves doing, making a living. Yeah, I I really like that. I think we really need to move away from just putting all of these labels and and this, like I said, this baggage on other animals and just thinking of them as little furry or scaly or whatever, feathered little people. yeah yeah we are the center of <laughs> you know we're the center of the human world but we're not the center of 
many of these animals worlds you know we don't feature in their worlds um, no and they... to the extent that we probably assume that we do yeah. you know? <laughs> and it seems like behavior that we would carry out while we were making our own living is judged differently if an animal does the same thing you know what i'm saying so it's like how dare the wolf eat an animal you know <laughs> when yeah. a lot of people eat animals too you know so yeah yeah yeah. Absolutely. if you got wolves who are like you know, getting it wrong. Is there a fable where you think, you know, wow, mostly uh, Aesop got it right when it comes to animal behavior? Yeah, I mean, I've already talked through the crow fable, which would be the classic one where they, he totally got it right. Um, and it's now sort of taken off as a whole research paradigm in, in animal cognition, which is very cool that Aesop's fable kind of sparked that as a way of investigating problem solving. So there are other fables where Aesop got it right, but I guess part of part of my aim with the book was to try and go a little bit further than just was it the same, you know, does do the fables support what we see in nature, for example? Um, because say if you look at something like the ant and the grasshopper, ants and grasshopper um to an extent that is sort of borne out by the evidence you know lots of ants do store up grain uh over the summer and they store it in granaries um and that lasts them through the winter and grasshoppers don't do that so on the surface of it that fable would be supported by what we see but if you go a little bit deeper and ask about whether that behavior um is is truly borne out in the terms of the cognitive processes that are going on then that's a really different question so the ants in Aesop's fable are projecting themselves forward mentally into the future they're um <laughs> they're doing what we call mental time travel they're anticipating <laughs> what's going to happen over the winter and the fact that they're going to need to store up food and they're sort of consciously doing that they're, they're storing that for that reason and that's not at all what happens in nature you know um right. so it's kind of like on the surface yes some of the fables match up but take a step deeper and things get a lot more complicated um right. and, and I suppose that's the same with the the dog and the, the shadow as well on the surface yes the dog didn't recognize itself but what does that actually tell us about dogs self-awareness um we need to go a little bit deeper to actually look into that more and i love that you have all these different animals in the book because i think sometimes when people are thinking about animals they're not thinking about ants and grasshoppers they're thinking about dogs and wolves maybe but not so much about insects so that's really interesting that they got to be included as well i think um mm. and so what is the main message that you think you would like people to take from from the book when they read the book? I think it's it's to think of animals as animals um overwhelmingly it's it's to move away from villainizing or you know venerating animals for things that are built on human abilities and just to see animals for what they really are because the truth of of what they can do and and why they do what they do is so much more interesting you know if we if we just think of them as these kind of one-dimensional characters which are villainous or cunning or uh, you know dumb donkey or whatever it is we're we're losing so much and I think that's such a shame I think the truth is so much richer if we actually look into what the science can tell us right <clears throat> yeah I agree I think in one of our last um um conversations we spoke with someone who wrote fiction um mm -hmm. and and she brought dogs in and they were often like big part, big characters in the novels. She's writing romance novels and, and there was like a veterinarian. And, you know, so she, she had these dogs who were like a big character. And I asked her like, how can you talk about dogs? And because she's a dog trainer too, how can you not just 
moralize about them and be like because I would find it really hard to write about dogs and not be like oh and you should pick up your dog's poop and you should stop treating mm. your dog like that like it would be hard for me not to try and educate and mm -hmm. I, I asked her how do you get away from that how do you actually pull that off so well and she said she treats the dog she makes sure that she always treats the dog like it's a real character like it's its own beast and I feel like that's kind of the the, the dog you know like animals are their own creatures they have their own motivations and they're 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 in their own ecological niche and they they you know they're doing what they need to do so I, I thought that was just like a cool sorry sort of I'm, I feel like I'm hearing that again from you like animals have we need to see them for who they are you know not mm. yeah totally and <laughs> and they are really they're 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 characters in their own stories I suppose um and I, I just think it's there's a bit of arrogance in the human species, I think, sometimes um, where we sort of put ourselves, at, we assume that we're at the centre of of all of it. And, you know, these animals are doing, yeah, exactly. They're yeah. making a living or yeah. they're doing what they need to do. And particularly, we've made life so much harder for so many animals. We're in this catastrophic world at the moment for biodiversity and and animals are just trying to get by in, in a world that we have made so hostile in so many ways I just think it's it's such a shame to then put these these moral labels on them um, and to sort of castigate them for things that are built on ancient stories I mean to me you know it's sometimes when I think about it like that it just seems like such a bizarre thing to be doing so I think that sort of that sort of leads us into my next question which is about sort of myth busting as dog trainers so as dog trainers a lot of times when we go into someone's house and we're helping them with their dog um people have these mythologies you know these fables i guess um about their dogs and a lot of times it's based on the misunderstanding of wolf behavior which i think you do a nice job of deconstructing in the book um or it's this morality like i you know people will say well whenever i leave my house my dog is is angry at me or is um sort of um you know, like is being, has this like feel of iniquity, you know, like she's getting back at me because I left mm. her alone. Or, so people have all of these, they sort of ascribe all of these human cognitive processes and emotions and stuff on animals, which make them misbehave when they're really not, you know, like typically yeah. the animal is just bored or is, is upset or, or what have you. Right. So, and I feel like this is, so having to deconstruct those myths, sometimes we have to, to get to move forward with our dog training clients and sometimes we can sort of dance around them um, depending on what's exactly going on um so i guess i feel like you're doing this in the book too you're trying to take these like literally take these myths and deconstruct them when it comes so i guess sort of you know how do you handle deconstructing myths to people who you're trying to teach you know you're teaching people about animal behavior how do you go about deconstructing myths like what what do you do <laughs> for that <laughs> I know it's kind of a big question, but if, if yeah. anything comes to mind. I mean, it's it's really hard. It's really hard when, because oh, just nudging people out of firmly held beliefs is, especially ones that have kind of been implanted as a child um, and then are continually reinforced through the films they see or the books they read or, you know, all of the other stories that they're hearing. Um and facts alone rarely work, you know, facts on their own aren't often enough to change people's minds or to change their behaviour. So, you know, I think it's got to be done through storytelling and it's got to be sort of, it's got to be done through things that are familiar. And that's one of the reasons um, that you picked up on, Christy, about using Aesop's fables as, as a really nice hook because everyone probably you know knows at least one or or a few of Aesop's fables um and I think it's by kind of just teasing them apart in a in a gentle way maybe you know not sort of going in and saying your beliefs are rubbish and <laughs> <laughs> you, you need to like rethink this entire um 
belief system that you've grown up with but but just encouraging people to do a little bit of their own research in a way like actually pay attention to this animal next time you see a crow or something um and just ask yourself a few questions and just just challenge yourself on what is actually going on um because i think that's that's the way that hopefully we can like try and get people to rethink what's what's going on i I didn't want to bombard people with just facts. It's not an encyclopedia because that's not going to work. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question at all. No, uh, no, you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, but it's still hard. It's still really hard. Um, and I think, I think the older that the audience gets, probably, and the, the more firmly held those beliefs are, it it's even harder. I, I need to write a children's version of this that would oh, be, that would right be so thing. cool yes <laughs> you totally should yeah and I mean quite a few animal books do end up becoming or having a young readers edition too so you know I'm surprised your publisher hasn't already asked you that if they're listening to this <laughs> they should ask you to do it because I think it would be really really popular especially yeah. because I mean children probably are the main people who read Aesop's animals I mean uh, as adults, you don't tend to go back to them. You remember them from your childhood. But so I, I think that, that would be a, a really, really nice idea too to to go with this. It would be a great companion. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And both in like the here, like the, the exact same thing that you're doing in this book, which is like sort of deconstructing or looking at the science. Could this actually be true? But also like rewriting some bowls so that they actually they, they have that same morality element or something or they have that same instructive that's so satisfying but they're they don't get the animal behavior stuff wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally totally i do think it's time for some new fables it's time yeah definitely a, a very different world yeah yeah well this is a wonderful book it's Aesop's Animals, The Science Behind the Fables. So it's out now in hardback and the paperback is coming out at the end of October in the UK. And I think you said January in North America. So yeah. Yeah. that's great. Yeah, it's, it's available on audiobook and it's lovely. So if anybody is an audiobook listener like me, <laughs> that's yes. how I consumed it. Yes, highly recommended. It's a fantastic book. Such a great read. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the section where we talk about other people's books. Um, and we're going to start with you, Joe. And if you can tell us about a book that you've read recently or started recently that you're enjoying, I think you've actually got more than one book to tell us about. So I'm looking forward to hearing what those are. Yeah, I've got I've got a couple of books, actually. Um, I try and balance fiction reading with nonfiction. Um I just think it's really good to have both. Um, so right now, I've just started, and I'm I'm well behind the times because this came out last year, but I've just started Lucy Cook's Bitch. Oops, Daisy. There we go. Um, I don't know if either of you have read it, but... Yeah, I yeah. loved it. <laughs> I am loving it so far. I just think she's such a good science communicator. Um, and it's it's just written in a really captivating way uh so yeah she's a fantastic writer she's expand sort of expelling all of the myths that have been laid down about male superiority really in science and um the idea that female animals are these sort of boring meek uh dull um creatures that and all the interesting stuff happens in the males of the species so that's one that I'm loving um and then on the fictional side although it's it's actually a little bit not completely fiction it's oh dear sorry it's called <laughs> venomous lump sucker uh, which is a great name um by Ned, Mo Ned Bowman um I don't know if either of you come across this one no uh I would really recommend it it's like a sort of satirical exploration of extinction, which doesn't sound fun, but, <laughs> but it, it is funny. And it's written in a fantastic way, um, sort of in this dystopian future where everything's gone to crap. Um, and there's an actual sort of business of extinction where people can trade extinction credits so like a big mining company could spend credits to 
to do what it wants and some animal will go extinct. So it's kind of like, it's exploring the topic of extinction um, through this venomous lump sucker fish, um, which is, it sounds bizarre. It's, it's, I'm really enjoying it. So I would totally <laughs> recommend it because it is funny and it is interesting. And there's actually quite a lot of science in it as well. Um, do you want my third or have I go on go on no let's go (laughs) it's the third third one which is the book that right now I'm just putting in my bag whenever I go somewhere because I'm trying not to scroll on my phone if I'm waiting for something or like if I'm on the bus or something Um, it's Surfacing by Kathleen Jamie who I love she's um, a Scottish poet and writer she's the national poet of Scotland actually and her words are just absolutely beautiful and she writes these essays about nature and observing and places um and they're just they're just beautiful she's like a master craftsman of prose I would say so there we go I'll I'll stop talking brilliant (laughs) thank you three great choices (laughs) thanks for sharing them with us Christy what are you reading at the moment okay so I'm reading I'm listening to see if I can make it I'm not sure if I can make it show up I can't read it from here. Anyway, it's called Being Mortal, and it's written by Atul Gawande, who's a surgeon. Um, and I, I have read and listened, listened to some of his other books and love him as an author. <clears throat> um, but the subtitle of this book is Medicine and What Matters in the End. And it's sort of like a, a, like a narrative and medical approach to death and dying in from the medical perspective. And it's sort of, he uses his like sort of the backbone of his dad um, having cancer and passing away as kind of like the the backbone of the book. And then he explores how medicine handles dying and how they talk about it and how they treat it and how, and it, it sounds like it would be really morbid, but it, it's not, it's actually super beautiful and it almost like releases you. And I feel, I feel like it, you know, every chapter I get through, I feel a little bit better about, you know, the people in my life who have passed away or my own, you know, fears of, mortality or whatever it, it I don't know so I, I would definitely recommend it I think it if if you're close to someone who's dying it's probably not the book for you right now but if you happen to have a little bubble of space it's I mean it's gorgeously written and it just has so much fascinating information that is I think you can really turn it around and and, and sort of feel better about yourself and your own grieving and everything so it's I'm loving it two thumbs up <laughs> despite it being morbid <laughs> good <laughs> sounds like a very good book um so what i am reading is before and after the book deal by courtney Moore. so obviously this is not a book aimed at me but i wanted to read it anyway because and see what it's like so it's it's for people who are trying to get a book deal and it takes them through what they need to do in order to get a book deal and then it takes that's the first part of the book and the second part it takes them beyond that through the process of getting published and what that's like at different kinds of publishers and what you have to do for marketing and publicity and so on so it's actually packed full of advice if someone is trying to get an agent or trying to get a book deal i would really recommend this book it's it's full of useful information from a wide range of different people and it's got things in it that people don't often talk about very much so it has numbers for how much how many copies you would like your book to sell depending on the kind of publisher you're with and that kind of thing so it does feel like it's a really straightforward guide to all the things that you need to know if you want to bring a book into the world and so I think you know for someone who is trying to get a book deal it's actually a really excellent book and it's funny as well reading through it's really well written in the way that it's it's written so um like i said not aimed at me obviously and i'm very lucky with an an amazing agent and an amazing publisher but i think for someone trying to get a book um, and it includes and surviving at the end it's a writer's guide to finishing publishing promoting and surviving your first book and i think there are moments when it's hard um, however well everything goes everyone has moments when it's just a really hard process too and it takes you through the hard times as well as the good times of trying to get your book out there so i found it a really good read Mm-hmm. Um, great so that brings us to the end of this podcast thank you so much for joining us joe it's been a real pleasure to chat with you and it was such a pleasure to read your book if people want to know more about you like where do they go where's your website and your social media oh so i have a website um which is just joewimpany.com um social media i'm on twitter but less now because I know, because. I, to be honest, 
I was just starting to build up like a presence and then all of this happened so I don't know where to channel my social media and stuff so I am on Twitter um, and it's at Joe Wimpany I'm also on Instagram and that tends to be where I'm just posting all of my kind of nature loving random animal things also at Joe Wimpany um, probably a bit more active on there but yes you can find me in either of those places great thank you so the book was Aesop's Animals we hope everyone enjoys this interview and you'll definitely love the book and if you've enjoyed this then please also make sure to hit the subscribe button so that you always catch future episodes when they're out thank you bye bye bye